Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Alexandra Schneider. I'm the Manager of Public Programs and Visitor Services at the History Center of Lake Forest, Lake Bluff. And I'm so excited that you all could join us here this evening. Um, if I haven't already done so for you, I would ask that you please mute your microphones to cut down on any ambient noise through the program. Um, and for best viewing, I recommend that if you have not already done so to select speaker view in the top right portion of your screen so that whomever is speaking appears uh, large and at the center of your, of your computer screen. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the program, but in order to make sure that there's not um, any sort of chaos with everybody popping up trying to answer to ask questions at the same time, I'm gonna ask you to direct your questions in the chat to me. You can select my name, Alex Schneider, with your questions, and I'll go ahead and uh, read those out for Professor Smith at the end of the program. Um, before introducing our speaker for the evening, I want to say a quick but very sincere thank you to Maddie Dugan for making our Zoom programming sponsor room Zoom blah, Zoom programming possible. There we go. All right. So our speaker this evening, Carl Smith, is the Franklin Bliss Snyder Professor of English and American Studies and Professor of History Emeritus at Northwestern University. He has written extensively on several facets of Chicago and its history, including Chicago and the American Literary Imagination, 1880 to 1920, Urban Disorder and the Shape of Belief, The Great Chicago Fire, The Haymarket, Haymarket Bomb, and The Model Town Pullman, The Plan of Chicago, Daniel Burnham, and the Remaking of the American City, and City Water, City Life, Water and the Infrastructure of Ideas in Urbanizing Philadelphia, Boston, and Chicago. In collaboration with Academic and Research Technologies at Northwestern and the Chicago History Museum, he is the author and curator of two major online exhibitions, The Great Chicago Fire and the Web of Memory and the Dramas of Haymarket. He is one of the founders of the Program in American Studies at Northwestern, of which he has served multiple times as director or associate director. And in 1994, he was named Charles Deering McCormick Professor of Teaching Excellence at Northwestern. Tonight, he is here to share his newest work with us, Chicago's Great Fire, The Destruction and Resurrection of an Iconic American City. And as a quick note, this book is available at the Lake Forest Bookstore and online through its publisher. You can find it. Um, and I also have included the link to purchase in the chat that's already there. So if you're interested, go ahead and give it a look. And with that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Carl Smith to take away his presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, and thanks for all the work you did in arranging this. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and now I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK. Uh, Chicago's Great Fire, The Destruction and Resurrection of an Iconic American City, uh, is uh, a narrative, re remarkably uh, the first fully researched, carefully written book about the uh, destruction of Chicago and then its resurrection. It includes about 70 contemporary illustrations, uh, most from the collections of the Chicago History Museum and seven maps created for the book by uh, Dennis McClendon of Chicago Cartographics. I'll share some of these with you tonight. Uh, the book focuses on events and people, a uh, key to understanding the fire and the rebuilding and the place of the fire in the city's history. It's meant to tell an exciting and engaging story. You can decide how exciting and engaging it is. It includes a very wide range of people, rich and poor, men and women and children, immigrants and Yankees, a lot of histories only deal with the, the uh, elite. It starts and ends with a very un-elite person, uh, uh, Ka uh, Catherine O'Leary. Uh, it starts with the story of Catherine and Patrick O'Leary and their five children, four cows, a calf and a horse, and her evolution from scapegoat to folk hero. Uh, she was innocent of starting the fire, in my opinion, at least. She was repeatedly cleared, even right at the beginning, 
most recently in 1997, there's a chapter in the book on who started the fire. And it puts all of this in its historical context. That context is the United States, developing United States in the 19th century. And here's a map of the United States in 1870. You could still see some of the, North, particularly in the North and the West, are territories still at this point. Uh, this context most uh, broadly includes the transformation of the United States from a rural to an urban nation uh, by immigration, westward movement, industrialization, the communication and transportation revolutions, all of which were most fully embodied by the uh, sudden rise of Chicago in the four decades before the fire from an obscure frontier outpost of maybe a hundred people uh, on the edge of the frontier to a major city of about 330,000 people. That was a nexus, an important nexus in an expanding national and international uh, network. The book has an overarching argument, and that is for all its remarkable achievement and justifiable boosterism, Chicago was highly flammable socially as well as uh, physically in terms of social volatility and physical volatility, the fire re revealed and intensified the considerable ethnic and class divisions in the city. Uh, the rebuilding, uh, which in its speed and, and scale demonstrated a large extent uh, that for all the booster rhetoric of Chicago's irrepre irrepressible destiny was in fact quite true. Chicago was this unstoppable force but it also revealed the extent to which Chicago delayed and resisted real uh, changes in making itself more fireproof. Well, let's get into the actual story. Here's one of the maps from the book of Chicago before the fire. Uh, Chicago was a much smaller place then than it is now, one sixth the current size with the northern border at Fullerton, western border at what is now Pulaski, the southern, southern border at what is now Pershing Road, 39th Street, and of course, the lake on the east. Um, and what this map does is it points out then as now that the Chicago River's three branches divided into its north, west, and south divisions. Uh, in 1840, Chicago was the 92nd largest city in the United States with about a little under 4,500 people. It was just behind, to put this in perspective, Beverly, Massachusetts. By 1870, as I said, it was 300,000 people, fourth or fifth biggest in the United States with about 30,000 more by the time of the fire. Here's more of a bird's eye view of the city where you can see it more clearly here. The river, uh, the, the main branch and the south branch and the north branch dividing into the three main divisions. What's important to notice here is a few things that are very different from today, how the lake came virtually up to Michigan Avenue and what we now know as Grant Park uh, and Millennium Park was just this thin stretch of land here and then the Illinois Central Railroad tracks here. And the Illinois Central Railroad in exchange for building a breakwater in the early 1850s got rights to run trains into the city along this trestle it built. So it created this little lagoon uh, between Michigan Avenue and the tracks. More about that soon. Chicago was not a stable or a unified city, and this gets into the social flammability. It had, first of all, very little past to, to draw on, and, and also remarkably little focus on the present. Since it was growing so fast, everybody was sure tomorrow would be different. It's very fitting that this was the place, place where the Chicago, where the commodities exchange or the futures market was devised. Everyone also seemed to be from somewhere else. You don't get these people by natural growth. You get them by immigration of all kinds. Uh, some from very far away. At the time of the fire, over 46% of the population, this was a drop from earlier, had been born abroad, not just families from abroad, but born abroad. About one in every five Chicagoans was born what would, became, what would become Germany in 1871. And more than one in eight was born in Ireland uh, with smaller representations from Scandinavia and Bohemia, what we now know as Czech Republic. 
these immigrants and their children, if you count people with at least one foreign born parent, constituted probably over 70%, well over 70% of the population. Uh, the other 30%, about two thirds of it was from the states of the old Northwest Territory, the six states, like Illinois and of course Ohio, Indiana, Minnesota and so on, um, uh, Wisconsin. I mean, uh, um, uh, but a, a bunch of them, about a quarter of them were from farther away, about 10% of Chicagoans, mostly the middle Atlantic and Northeastern states. Uh, um, uh, and a lot of Chicago's leadership came from here. Uh, George Pullman and Potter Palmer came from upstate New York, a Marshall Field from central Massachusetts. There was a vital African-American community, but it was pretty small. It constituted at this point only about 1.2% of the population. African-Americans could only vote in Chicago since 1870 and the public schools would not be integrated for a few more years. They lived mostly in the area we now know called the South Loop. Women did not get the vote for another half century. And one of the Chicagoans whose fire experience the book discusses is this woman, uh, quite a remarkable woman, a woman named Myra Bradwell, whom the state of Illinois, who was extremely well qualified, edited a, a, a publication called the Chicago Legal News, but the state of Illinois in its wisdom said, while she was intellectually up to it, she could not practice law uh, because she was a woman. Uh, and then this went to the Supreme Court a few years after the fire and the Supreme Court backed the state of Illinois eight uh, by a vote of eight to one in the famous case of Bradwell versus Illinois, which Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, talked a great deal about in some of her work and obviously got it reversed in many ways. It's important in talking about all these groups not to think of them as monoliths, such as the Germans or the Irish or the Yankees. There are uh, too many people to consider a monolith and there are considerable differences among them. But as a general rule, immigrants and their children made up the vast majority of the skilled and unskilled working people uh, and ethnicity, class and religion, again, as a general rule, correlated. In particular, it's very, very hard to overstate the overt in the daily papers, no, no hint of a political correctness, anti-immigrant, especially anti-Irish Catholic prejudice in multiple mainstream papers, as well as anti-labor union sentiment. While the native born Yankee elite, this very small percentage of the city ran city politics up to mid-century, including a weak mayorality and the strong unicameral uh, uh, legislative body, the Common Council became the City Council in 1875. Immigrants constituted by the time of the fire, a majority of the voters, about 56%. And ethnic politicians, especially Irish ones, controlled a similar percentage of seats on the Common Council. And the wealthy native born population was very unhappy with the situation and attacked the integrity of ethnic politicians with some justification, but not to the extent of the complaints. Uh, this kind of commentary fed on stories through the summer and fall of 1871 on the exposure of indictment of Boss Tweed in New York and the Tweed Ring. Tweed, by the way, was a British of British Protestant ancestry. There were cultural issues that divided people too, particularly along the uh, temperance. Uh, the Yankee elite was uh, very strong on temperance and one way to condemn the Irish and the Germans was as for their, uh, the, the importance of alcohol in their lives and vice versa. Getting back to class rather than ethnicity as such, a strong distrust of unions. Uh, owners of, 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 of large employers said this got in the way of individual right, the individual's right to negotiate the terms of labor. Labor had a very tough time in the late 1860s, but was regathering through the early 1870s. And the city, as I've already said, was physically very, very flammable. Chicago in 1871 was a terrible top fire trap, built too quickly, too sloppily, a disaster waiting to happen. Homes, stores, and other buildings, uh, 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 something like 
60,000 buildings in the city, about 40,000 made entirely of wood. A lot like this. This is the O'Leary home. They actually had two houses, uh, two cottages packed together on a very small lot with the barn beyond the one in the rear. They lived in the one in the rear and rented out the one in front. You can see how marginal this life was. Uh, but note not only the house, all wood, but a, a raised wooden sidewalk. The fire gets under here. It's just nothing but tinder. And even in this very poor neighborhood, uh, this kind of uh, pine fence, uh, just just nothing but fuel. Uh, notice, of course, uh, like most streets in the city, uh, to Coven Street, on which they lived, was unpaid. Um, but even better buildings aren't so good. This is the so-called courthouse. Uh, this was the uh, of it as today the combined city hall and Cook County building, and in the same. Uh, square bounded by by Clark Street and Randolph and LaSalle and Washington Street. The earlier building built in the 1850s and the center here, at, but with a cupola recently put on and recently new wings, very sloppily built, a wooden cupola uh, 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 and a lot of downtown buildings had wooden decoration on them, had signs all over them, uh, a, a place really uh, very, very unsafe. Um, uh, on the plus side, Chicago had a state-of-the-art fire department, such as it was in terms of equipment, all steam pumping engines and the like. Uh, it had a state-of-the-art telegraph alarm system throughout the city, but it was much too small. It didn't keep up with the growth of the city. A city of well over 300,000 people, there were probably under 200 active firemen throughout the city. And again, uh, there was wood everywhere. There were plenty of warnings about the dangers of all this from the fire department itself, but also in leading newspapers like the Tribune. Uh, but people did not want to, uh, and I mean, including wealthy people, did not want uh, a larger fire department because that meant more taxes, more regular, and they didn't want anyone to tell them how, what to do with their property. And working people who basically lived in wooden houses didn't want uh, a, a lot of change in this way. Um, so there's tremendous resistance to doing anything about it. People do not like to pay for something that might happen uh, and so on. Well, besides the fact that the city was so flammable, uh, the other factors that led to the fire was that the summer and fall of 1871 were extremely dry in the whole upper middle west with hot days in early October, the temperature reaching into the early 80s and strong winds out of the southwest. In the week before the fire, the fire began October 8th, night, Sunday night, October 8th. There were about two dozen fires. Uh, um, uh, most importantly, a major fire the night before. This was the so-called Saturday night fire, uh, which broke out in an area, a uh, kind of industrial uh, factory area, just west of the south branch of the Chicago River. North is to the right here. Uh, this is basically the area where Union Station is now. Uh, and it burned from late Saturday night and well into Sunday. Uh, uh, breaking a lot of equipment and disabling a good portion of the fire department. Uh, and uh, so the, and the so-called Great Chicago Fire broke out only a few hours after that. Uh, the, the, the Saturday night fire in the afternoon and the Great Chicago Fire around nine o'clock on Sunday night. And the fire that began in the O'Leary barn uh, was nothing extraordinary or sinister. It was just a kind of commonplace fire that, that just happens. We, uh, but the real question is why even something so trivial like this could cause such damage. It's attributable to things I've already mentioned, the way the city was built, also the long dry summer and the strong wind from the southwest and so on. And there was one more final deadly factor, which was an inexplicable failure in the alarm system that delayed the arrival of the first crews of firemen by about half an hour, by which time with the high wind, the fire was virtually beyond stopping and the city's fate was absolutely sealed if it hadn't been already 
by about 3.30 in the morning when the roof of the pumping station, still there on the east side of Chicago Avenue, uh, of uh, Michigan Avenue, then called Pine Street at Chicago Avenue, uh, fell in. And Chicago burned from about 9 p.m. Sunday, October 8th to early in the morning of Tuesday, October 10th, about 30 hours. Here's this view of, uh, uh, after the fact of the city on fire. Thanks to the southwest wind, the fire moved generally, but not unvaryingly, from the O'Leary neighborhood about a mile southwest of the downtown, across the south branch of the Chicago River to destroy the entire commercial downtown, very much where it is today, and then leaped across the main branch to destroy almost the entire north side. It wasn't a single body of fire, but thanks to the wind and powerful updrafts, throwing chunks of flaming Chicago into the air and then blowing them ahead, many different fires at once that would combine and separate and go in different directions. And attempts to map it look something like this. Um, this is a map from the Encyclopedia of Chicago. Uh, and what you see here in, in the purple is on Sunday night in the lower left there with the O'Leary barn in the very lower left corner and then into uh, uh, starting the very late Sunday night and through Sunday night, the red area of the downtown, but you see reaching already into the north side there and then moving back further south and farther north uh, through the day on Monday. Uh, and and you see only to, it's only late in the afternoon that this part of Chicago burns and this part of the north side burns and then into the evening the fire going up to here extending up to the border at Fullerton. It's hard to examine. I'm sorry, exa exaggerate. I'm sorry. It, it it's just a, a a crazy scene throughout. Here's an image of, of the wild scene in the streets downtown of people grabbing relatives and their property and trying to run. Uh, where could you run? You try to get out of the downtown if you're there. You go to the lakefront, you go north, um, uh, or you go west above where the fire is. This is a, what's called the rush for life over the Randolph Street Bridge, which did not burn in the fire. Uh, we're looking sort of northeast uh, from the west side as people are rushing across the Randolph Street Bridge. Um, and afterwards, where do they go? They go to the lakefront. They some wade into the lake. They go to the west side. Some go farther north to what was then the city cemetery, which began at North Avenue. Uh, Lincoln Park at that point was virtually new. It only existed for a few years, and it basically began a half mile north of North Avenue at Wisconsin Street. And, but the bodies were being moved out and the park was gonna move further south uh, for health reasons. Uh, and the bodies being moved into uh, graves outside uh, the city limits. Um, but you see here the great mix of people and the abandoned goods along the way and the strange scene of the living in the land of the dead. It, as I was about, to, I said a few minutes ago, it's virtually impossible to overstate the damage. Uh, a note again here that north is to the right. The fire burned an area about four miles long and two thirds of a mile wide, one of the great urban fires in history, 122 miles of sidewalks, 200 million in property value, about a third of the value of the city. I mean, make note, it did not destroy the whole city, but it did do the whole downtown and virtually all of the North side did about a third, 18,000 buildings, the north side losing 13,300 of 13,800 buildings, three of the four downtown railroad depots, 1,600 stores, 28 hotels, 60 factories, 39 of 165 churches. And the losses include everything in these places. People tried to take what they could, but they could take very little. And much of it they abandoned along the way as they ran for their lives. Uh, and of these people, 90,000, uh, more than a quarter of the whole city were left homeless and more without jobs. To put this in perspective, 90,000 people 
was equal to the entire population of Cleveland at the, this time. And Cleveland was about the 15th biggest city in the country. The devastated city was unnerving, a kind of uh, 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 disorienting wasteland with its own eerie beauty. And you get some wonderful photographs. So this of the Van Buren Street Bridge. Interestingly, this was taken by a photographer named George Barnard, who was also known for his photographs of Richmond uh, and Atlanta after, uh, after the ravaging of the Civil War. Uh, they look a lot like that. Uh, here you see a photograph of the courthouse uh, in ruins. Look at these, see these finials up here. Uh, it's just a little note that you can, uh, if you look at uh, Clark Street near where Armitage hits it, there is one of these finials just sitting there without any labeling on it. And this is a finial from uh, the, the, the courthouse, the city hall that was about half a dozen of these were saved and were in various places. Um, and here's a photograph, which is the same one on the cover of the book, uh, the corner of State and Madison a few days after the fire. The streetcars have started running again at half fare. Uh, people are gathering rubble. There's, there's posters about where to get help over here. And they're gathering bricks and throwing them into bins like this for possible reuse. Uh, and a lot of them were recycled. Uh, the city was understandably stunned, but relief measures started almost immediately, despite the lack of precedence and nothing at all like what we know as a safety net. The city was the beneficiary of an extraordinary outpouring of help from outside. That's one of the great affirmative stories of the fire. While Chicago was burning, there were meetings in other cities because they heard of it through their newspapers, which got the news through the telegraph that Chicago was burning and there were meetings in cities to raise money, get supplies and send it to Chicago. This is on Monday afternoon while Chicago was still burning in Cleveland. There was one in Faneuil Hall in Chicago. There were other ones, I'm sorry, in Boston and other places. And trainloads of food and supplies and pledges of cash are on their way to Chicago, as I said, even while the city is burning. One famous incident is the somewhat uh, um, buccaneer uh, uh, um, financier, the uh, unethical financier of the Gilded Age, Jim Fisk, uh, loading up a, a wagon with supplies that he then took to a train on for his Erie Railroad. And, and this train supposedly set speed records going as fast as 60 miles an hour, sending supplies to stricken Chicago with people along the way, throwing more into it. Uh, the, but the aid came from everywhere, including Japan, Germany, uh, South America. It totaled in the end of equivalent of about $200 million in today's dollars in aid. And the rebuilding started almost immediately, a really heroic effort, getting the city, the newspapers publishing by Wednesday after the fire, water service restored within about a week or two, schools reopened, and a semblance of functioning. And there's stories that relate to this, such as that of the real estate dealer, William D. Carefoot, who had a a building on Washington Street just east of the courthouse and quickly threw up this shack to say, I'm back in business. You see amidst the rubble and this, you see over here a sign that he painted on the wall. That's part of the Chicago History Museum collections that says, William D. Carefoot is at 59 Union Park, all gone but wife, children and energy. Uh, for a while, burned out businesses found temporary quarters in the West and the South Division, some in houses. So you have a house that have a bank on one floor and lawyer and a shoemaker in it, um, just doing business, getting going. Marshall Fields took over a, and then was called Field and Lighter. It's a whole other story. Uh, uh, took over an abandoned, uh, not abandoned, a, a streetcar barn at 20th and State Street gutted it out and started doing retail business there. And first slowly and then more rapidly, buildings began to rise in the downtown in the fall and the winter of 1871-72. The first were only temporary. These are just some, if you see frame buildings, these are on the east side of Michigan Avenue in what is now Grant Park. 
And you see at this point, even Michigan Avenue was a dirt street. And Lake Michigan is right behind these buildings. But it, it, it just looks like a kind of country, a Western town on the frontier. But this is how things were getting going right there. Uh, there were some uh, delays in rebuilding, some waiting for insurance. At least uh, only about half of Chicago was insured and only about half the insurance proved to be good. Uh, and there was some lack of clarity over property ownership because all the city records were burned. And there was a law passed called the Burnt Records Act, which allowed um, some of the records used by title companies to stand as legal. But as things got going farther, more sophisticated buildings, using derricks, building very quickly, very uh, 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 a, um, uh, a new Chicago rising. There was no city hall. There was only a temporary one for about 20 years, uh, but there was a temporary one at, at Adams and LaSalle where the Rookery building now is. The kind of buildings put up right after the fire were not skyscrapers. One of the untrue thoughts about the fire is that it immediately ushered in the skyscraper revolution, that's not really till the mid 1880s. The buildings were a little bit higher, they were better built, um, uh, but, but it looked not all that different from before the fire. Uh, there's a few of these buildings that still stand. Uh, there's the um, uh, Franklin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, I think I've got this. Uh, yeah, I'm ahead of myself here. You see a new downtown coming up again, um, north is to the right. Um, and this downtown was about 45 square blocks and about twice the size of the pre-fire downtown. And some of the rubble from the fire uh, was just dumped into the lagoon, filling in the lagoon here. Uh, so the, the solid land went all the way to the railroad tracks. Those railroad tracks, as you know, are still there. If you go to the Art Institute, you see them through the window, the IC tracks. Uh, and that, But more fill has gone even further beyond that. But that's a 20th century story. And we can get to that if you want to, but um, that's another story. The kinds of buildings that were built after, I wanted to tell you before, is things like the that still stand is this Washington building at Washington and Franklin next to uh, the L, uh, lost in the much larger buildings all around it. But this is only about four and a half stories. You see a, a building, uh, quite a handsome sandstone building. In all, the fire did not change, but accelerated developments already underway before it happened. The expansion of the downtown and the general outward movement of factories and people including to places like Lakeville, Rogers Park, Evanston, and dare I say it, uh, Lake Forest. Um, we're going in this period already at the time of the fire from what was called the walking city uh, to the streetcar and the commuter train city. So it enabled people to live farther away. And, they, uh, and then when factories also move out of the downtown, particularly farther south and west along the south branch of the Chicago River, people move there too to be able to walk to them. So uh, there's a general movement of, of residential and non-commercial activity from the downtown out to far, farther areas. The rebuilding was celebrated in the fall of 1873, just two years after the, this terrible fire with a great trade fair held in a brand new enormous three cupola building on the lakefront. I'm sorry, I'm again ahead of myself. Here's a map of Chicago after the fire and you see the footprint of the fire right here. Um, from up here and up to here and the Saturday night fire is this area right over here. I'm going to talk about this inset here in a minute. As I was saying, uh, the rebuilding was celebrated actually less than two years after the fire and starting in September of 1873 with a great interstate trade fair in this enormous building, uh, thousands of glass windows in the roof, uh, the Interstate Exposition Building. It was on the east side of Michigan Avenue where Adams Street hits it. This is the exact same site of the Art Institute of Chicago. And this was torn down in the early 1890s to make way for the building of the original building of the Art Institute of Chicago, which of course, the lions in front of it 
which of course is still very much there. Um, the recovery was celebrated even more 20 years later, 22 years or 20 years after this, with the world's Columbian Exposition in Jackson Park. Um, and uh, here's a photograph of the Court of Honor in Jackson Park, uh, looking uh, uh, west from the lake, from the lake behind us. Uh, but one of the, the key symbol of the fair was this figure that was designed called the, the I Will Woman, this kind of Amazon uh, with a crown on her head in which uh, a phoenix is nested. I'm not sure what this does for her hair, but the symbol of the, uh, of the phoenix city and then the spirit of Chicago on her breastplate is inscribed, I Will. And uh, the biggest day by far in terms of attendance at the fair was October 9th, the 22nd anniversary of the fire, Chicago Day, with a great Colombian carnival. And you see the, the uh, I Will woman over here. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, Chicago likes to celebrate the anniversary of the fire with what else? Fireworks, um, but great parade and pageants and all kinds of things. But this rebuilding was hardly smooth or simple or unanimous. Chicago fire caused deep concerns among the Yankee elite, who to give them credit had done much to build the city in which they had prospered. Uh, and they thought the inherently unstabilizing nature of such an event would create an opportunity for this underclass, all these immigrants to cause terrible damage and seize control. And it's in this context, I think we can fully understand the story of Mrs. O'Leary and her cow. Uh, it's a way to scapegoat immigrants, among other things. Uh, the book talks about this at length, and I don't want to get to it here, but I will if you want in the questions. In spite of this and the fact that poor Chicagoans, as is the timeless pattern in disasters, suffer, suffered as they did in the, as they have done in the uh, uh, COVID pandemic, uh, disproportionately from the fire and had fewer recovery resources of every kind, less insurance, less credit, less of a network of influential people to help them out. Um, in this context, though, the Yankee elite stage a kind of multi-part coup in the days and following the fire, convincing the current mayor, Roswell Mason, to take two steps. The mayor was a weak figure, but Mason was able to do this amidst the confusion. They got him to appoint this man, Philip Sheridan, a hero of the uh, Civil War. And perhaps you've heard this name, Sheridan, those of you who live in uh, Lake Forest. Uh, I hear they named a fort after him. Uh, this is partly because of his service after the fire uh, in helping protect Chicago. Um, and Sheridan Road, of course, is military road. But we can get into that if you want later on. Uh, but there basically is martial law in the city for two weeks after the fire. There's a sketch from the time of a soldier downtown and we're confronting people saying, you've got, you know, where are you going? What do you want? Uh, requiring passwords and the like. Uh, it was very illegal and very irregular. A larger step in this coup I talk about involved taking control of that, all the money that was sent to the people of Chicago, a small elite charity called the Chicago Relief and Aid Society basically seized control of the funds and the administration of its distribution in a way, in some ways, protecting the people of Chicago from themselves and wanted to get people back to work and rebuild Chicago as it was. Uh, tremendous effort in many ways, and I don't want to fault it in helping thousands of families and people in, with clothing, with food, with shelter, with jobs, but very much controlled from the top down. A third part of this coup was the election in, a, in, a mayor, in the mayor election only a month after the fire of this man, Joseph Medill, not at this time editor, but part owner of the Chicago Tribune on a kind of fireproof ticket to make sure that a safer city was rebuilt. But there are all kinds of, of problems that really broke down along class and ethnic lines. There were objections that Sheridan protected the rich from the poor and the native born from the immigrants when the poor needed the most help. That there was discrimination against the poor and the foreign born by the Relief and Aid Society. 
that there was discrimination against working people, Mai Bendil, particularly his desire to extend what were called fire limits to the whole city. Fire limits were an early form of zoning. They designated where you could build with what materials. And he wanted to say no more wooden exterior buildings all have to be brick and stone. And for working people, they claimed that, first of all, they didn't cause the fire. It didn't happen uh, on their part, but also they could not afford to build with these more expensive materials. And Chicago had this tradition different from other places of a fairly large number of working people who owned their own homes. And now they had this land that they couldn't build a house they could afford. The land was worthless. And they thought this was a way that wealthy people were trying to seize the land. Um, this all culminated in January 15th, 1872 with a march by working people on the temporary city hall that was built, as I said, at Adams and LaSalle, where the Rookery building is, it broke in, that there was a discussion of fire limits and it broke into a wild melee uh, over uh, protest against extended fire limits. The result of all this is that there was a very, there was extended fire limits, but it was limited not to where working people Lived, but even though uh, the, it was extended, it wasn't really enforced. And in fact, and this gets that little inset I showed you in what we now call the South Loop, there was a serious major downtown fire in the summer of 1874. The bad feeling along class, and Chicago was really not safe from fire for decades. Uh, the bad, feel, uh, bad feeling along class and ethnic lines continued with separate views of who are the people of Chicago and who should determine its future. In the election of 1873, there was a switch back to the other side where an extraordinary combination of Irish and German workers elected their mayor uh, as opposed to Medill. And this then all hardened by what stopped the rebuilding of Chicago, not it, 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 its energy, but a terrible national, international, uh, depression called better known as the panic of 1873 over extension of credit mostly to railroads and banks and companies collapsed. Uh, this led to a lot of unemployment in Chicago and a demonstra a mass demonstration around you know, around Christmas time of 1873-74 of working people around the headquarters of the Relief and Aid Society demanding aid which the Relief and Aid Society did not give. And just to show you the two directions, the kind of triumphant direction and this direction of conflict in which Chicago went in the period after the fire based on things that come out of the fire. 1873, the fall of 1873 brought two different newcomers to Chicago. These two guys, the one on the left is the then teenage architect, Louis Sullivan, who had lost his job in Philadelphia because of the panic. And this man on the right, an, a, a political agitator named Albert Parsons, who was then a printer. And, and Sullivan went on to lead the, one of the leaders of the Chicago School of Architecture and the uh, triumph of, of architecture and such things as the auditorium building in his partnership with Dankmar Adler. And, and, and Parsons became the only American of the eight men tried for the Haymarket bombing and one of the four who was hanged for it. So the simple story of the fire being destruction and then resurrection is absolutely justified. It's a remarkable, remarkable story, but it's not the whole story. Uh, and such events are always part of the larger issues of their time, which however they evolve are, as we can see today, never finally resolved. Thank you. here we are. Oh, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat right now. Uh, you can address them to me and I'll go ahead and read them out. Um, and while you're doing that, I just wanted to ask for comment. One of the things that struck me most about what you were showing were these incredible illustrations of, of the fire, of the aftermath, the photographs. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about, you know, that artistic draw and sort of the um, the media coverage and legacy? Yes, I mean, this was the story of the last part of 1871. Uh, if, if one of the ways that they dealt with people who were homeless is that they got free passes out of the city, but the trains that were taking people out of the city were bringing reporters and sketch artists and photographers to the city. And this, it ties into the fact that this is a period when we see a real change in publishing, where between steam driven presses and cheap pulp paper and railroads, we start getting now the possibility of mass circulation newspapers and news weeklies like Harper's Weekly. And they just doubled the, the circulation run of these things because people just wanted to know. Uh, and, and, and there's you, at this point, so the artists come and meanwhile they're turning out lithographs. I mean, there's this, this kind of insatiable market and they feed on each other. They still, and then within a few weeks, 500 page instant histories um, of, of, and we see this now even so, yeah, but, but again, the capability between the telegraph and the steam press and the railroad is there. And we see this phenomenon coming, the, what we might call the instant news event. Uh, because of the telegraph, people in New York probably knew more of what was happening in Chicago than people in Chicago, because people in Chicago are running for their lives. Right. They have no newspapers. You know, the, you know, the, there's no telephone or anything like that. And so people elsewhere, and there are pictures of people crowded around the, the newspaper offices where they post the stories before they print them and newsboys shouting it all out. And there are stories, there are novels of the fire. There's poetry. John Greenleaf Whittier immediately writes a poem that's a terrible poem. And it's everywhere printed and reprinted everywhere. There are dime novels immediately uh, and all kinds of things. It becomes this, you know, it's, you see the popular culture feeding on the news event and ginning it up even farther. Uh, you know, that a lot of people talk about there's a, an even larger fire the same night. The so this speaks to the dryness and the fire proneness of the upper middle west. The soak, the Peshtigo fire. Uh, in a lumber town and larger area about near Green Bay, about 250 miles north of Chicago. And this, to this day, except, you know, for a straight fire, as opposed to things like, let's say, the World Trade Center, it's the, still the largest single loss of life in any fire in American history. And very people, few people know about it because Chicago's already in the spotlight. I was talking about someone today there. There are a zillion custody cases going on, but Britney Spears' case is the one because we've already got the spotlight on our Britney. Um, uh, and Chicago is like that. And, you know, it's just right, you know, at the core of the news. So, and also um, people know about Chicago. They know their food has come from there. They know all kinds of things. Uh, and they feel it as, as if their, their world is burning, is threatened here. Uh, so it's it's remarkable and and uh, all consuming in every sense of the word. There's songs of the fire, um, sermons, all, uh, all kinds of things. And I'm not talking just in Chicago. I'm talking everywhere. That's incredible and and surely very valuable in writing and writing a book like right. this. Well, I'm a, I, I mean, this it. is part of the fun of writing this. I I. I this book is largely based on first-person accounts. I've read a few hundred of them, and then newspaper reporting from the time. I'm trying to see the fire as a human experience through people's eyes as they witnessed it. There's no photographs of the fire, so all we have as the count there are a zillion photographs of the burned city afterward but none, none of the fire, including another phenomenon of time, the stereographs, if you've seen these, the, the right. double pictures and, mm -hmm. three, and there's before and after pictures and so on. But I try to see it as they experience it going forward as a very human event. And how did they explain it to each other? How did they visualize it? How did they see it? And these stories, these poems, these 
these songs, these sermons, these novels, is really them trying to explain this event to themselves, usually trying to fit it into some framework they already have. Uh, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, William McClinton would like to know, um, you mentioned that there was also the fire up in Wisconsin near Green Bay, but if there was an impact of this fire on the Lake Geneva region. Uh, I think a number of wealthy, the short answer is no. There, there are stories of some wealthy Chicagoans go, you know, who had burned out going to Lake Geneva where they had spent the summer. I'm not sure that many of them at this point had homes as yet as they would. But I think they they would. Uh, and there's one of the most charming things. There's a, a a letter written by a that the history museum makes a lot by a, a uh, I think a, a, a twelve year old boy named uh, um, Justin Butterfield who lived downtown uh, to a friend about the fire. And the, what's charming is that he draws a, a a picture of his family leaving the fire and of him leading his pet goat. There's a picture of that in the book, but it's it's dated Lake Forest. Um, that that's some friend in Lake Forest took them in. Um, uh, so, uh, but I don't, as far as I know, Lake Geneva did not suffer from the fire and may have even had some, uh, pro, you know, um, there's one particular family, a family of, I talk about, of a former mayor named Julian Rumsey, who was a uh, grain broker and a banker who uh, the family basically went to and just moved back to where they'd spent the summer to Lake Geneva. And, and they had money in the bank there even. This is where I talk about how wealthy people have a kind of cushion in a way that Mrs. O'Leary didn't have money in the bank in, in uh, uh, Lake Geneva. Um, Lisa McMahon would like to know what the um, sort of casualty count was for the Chicago fire versus the Green Bay fire, if we have those. Sure, references. I should have mentioned that. The miracle of the great Chicago fire, such as it is, is that as far as we can tell, and it's very hard to tell because bodies disintegrated and there's a lot, of, I mean, we're incinerated and there were uh, a lot of single people that maybe nobody ever looked for them. Uh, but the count is usually around 300 is the estimate. Uh, the count for the um, Peshtigo fire is, goes as high as 1,500. I might add that when I say that Chicago was not safe from fire, the, uh, another famous fire is in 1903. This is 32 years after the Great Chicago Fire, the Iroquois Theater Fire, downtown theater, poorly constructed, but poor eggs and so on. 600 people, twice the number of people died in the Chicago fire, died. And um, uh, mostly mothers and children. It was a holiday matinee. Um, and no firemen died in the Chicago fire. Uh, a lot of firemen have died in the line of duty, but not in this one. And it's probably because they saw it and they could run. And they did. As a follow-up to that, well, um, while the uh, the Peshtigo fire was whoosh, you know, just through a. Um, second part of her question is that she heard that there was um, a possibility that meteors were involved in starting that that fire, or possibly was that there's a book by a man named Mel Waskin called Mrs. O'Leary's Comet, or something like that. And what it does is it takes the fact of this coincidence, coincidence. There was a big fire in Chicago, big fire in Peshtigo, and another big one in Manistee across the lake. And this theory that a meteor came in and broke up into multiple pieces and set them all on fire. I've never seen hard proof for that. Anything is possible. <laughs> Almost. Fair, fair enough. Um, you said you, you used a lot of um, firsthand accounts of the fire. In, was there anyone, and I, I don't know 
the literacy rates in, in, you know, Mrs. O'Leary's household or neighborhood, but are there any accounts from her household or that neighborhood? That's the tricky part here. And it's another thing, people who are wealthier are likely to have more education, paper, pen, postage, time, servants. And so the overwhelming number of accounts we have and also connections to things like this history museum are from those kind of people well there's plenty of from people in the city to families elsewhere there's probably a whole cache of things that we at least i haven't put my hands on people writing to europe to tell what happened mrs o'leary was illiterate she could not write anything what do we have from her we have that a literate person went and talked to her and her husband and got them to sign to and listen to them and wrote down affidavits and got them to sign with an X. And they also, there was a fire inquiry held by the fire department in November and early December. And a lot of people in the O'Leary neighborhood testified. So we have them saying there what happened and what they did uh, along with interviews. But it, it, it's a challenge, but I tried as best I could, as I said, to have children as well as adults, uh, 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 immigrants as well as uh, as native born. I read the particularly the leading German newspaper, uh, the Staatszeitung, Illinois Staatszeitung, um, and this is a very different point of view from the um, things like the Tribune and the Times, but even these very deeply prejudiced papers in their interviews, they, they, they talk to people and they, they want to make fun of them, but they reveal more than they, than they know that, about these people, including how they're victimized, among other things. The Tribune had as a reporter, I'm sorry, the New York Tribune had as a reporter at the time, a man named John Hay, who had been Lincoln's secretary during the war and later would be secretary of state under but he came and he went and basically interviewed, tried, went to the O'Leary neighborhood and he goes to it like he's going to, you know, the deepest, darkest, worst place, like hell itself. And he makes terrible fun. But in many ways, what he does is mainly reveal his own class prejudices. Right. And that's how you get a lot of um, the satirized images, I'm sure, of her as well that were mentioned. Oh, absolutely. And I try, as you see in reading the book, to let their voices, let the people, let the, them speak, hear their voices. I also have uh, links listed to places where you can find this first person narratives yourself um, and look at them in more detail. Okay. But I have ones of a railroad worker, of a a 17-year-old Irish woman, probably a domestic servant, uh, a bunch of other things like that. That's fascinating. So we have time for one more question. So um, Taya asks, with so many businesses destroyed, after all these businesses are destroyed, what kind of opportunities are there for employers or employment, I'm assuming, after the fact? Well, the important thing is to remember, again, what didn't get destroyed. Um, uh, most of the lumber was still there. Most of the grain was still there. The, the, the um, railroad was still intact, uh, except for right in the center of downtown. The telegraph wires were still intact. And most important, the location was still intact. Chicago has this place between the manufacturing east and the mining and agricultural west. And a Chicago leader, a man named William Bross, immediately jumped on a train, went to New York and spoke to the Chamber of Commerce there and says, never a better time to invest. And, and outside money built Chicago and then it rebuilt it. So the opportunities are coming there. Some of them are in construction, among other things. But businesses are still do get going slowly, but it's a tough time. And some of this is... People are supported for a while in terms of food, particularly by these contributions that are sent to the city. But there is a, a period to get them through. 
but it's a real struggle. And some people go under, some people leave, but it's so interesting. The net thing is Chicago population at the end of 1872 is bigger than it was at the beginning. And it's bigger at the end of 1872, you know, two, three and four and five. And it just keeps on going. Whatever, Chicago is still the place. It's where the future happens. Well, I like to say it's a terrible thing to, to, to say, if, but if Chicago had to be destroyed, it couldn't have been a better moment in this upward thing when there's a demand for this place and things to be made there, shipped there, um, sold there, and so on. And it just keeps on coming. It's, you know, if Chicago were hit like this today, it couldn't bounce back. And we saw in Katrina hit New Orleans, it couldn't, it was just a different time in its history. So Chicago, if it was going to be hurt like this, it couldn't have picked a better time. Uh, I do not believe in, I do not believe in fortune, you know, that this is a good thing. Uh, it's too much suffering, too much destruction, too much loss. But as you said, that Phoenix imagery then really comes into play, just completely regrowing. That's so, that's, that's such a fascinating, you know, thought about that, about that historic moment. Well, thank you so much for sharing this work with us. Really, really appreciate it. And thank you all so much for being here this evening. Um, thank you for quick, listening. <laughs> this is a really great, we had a great group tonight. And thank you all so much for your really thoughtful questions. Um, I want to let you know we have a couple walking tours coming up before the weather turns if you'd like to join us. Um, we have one of the Lasker Estate on October 9th, which is generously sponsored by Roland and Turnbaugh. And then we also have Blocks, Plates, and Stones, an evolutionary history of cartographic printing and design, which also should be a very fascinating evening. So I hope you'll come back to join us again. Thank you all again for being here. And thank you again, Professor Smith. We really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, have a good night, everyone.